Thank you so much. Good night, team. You just lead us to the throne. I'm, I know. I know. We all are just blessed by the opportunity to worship and praise Him. You know, and of course, our praise team. That's the ministry of what they what they're really all about. Is that they're about praise and worship, and they want to lead us and use the gifts that they've developed by not only been being given the ability by the Lord. But just given an ability doesn't mean that you're going to be able to do things like this. It takes a lot of discipline and a lot of effort and a lot of sacrifice. You know, a lot of talent is spelled W-O-R-K. I don't know if you know that. I know a lot of times we pray for things. We say, Lord, give me the ability to play or sing or whatever it might be. And what we're really praying is, Lord, give me something that I don't have to work for. But I don't know if you know this or not, but that very rarely ever happens. I'm not saying it doesn't ever happen, but it would be a rare, rare thing for you all of a sudden to wake up and have the ability to do something like this, never having disciplined yourself, never having learned and practiced and, and developed a skill or a talent. Oh, sure, it's the Lord that gives you the initial ability, because I know some of you can't sing because you can't even tell what pitch we're on or key, you know, I mean, I know some of you are standing beside people that if the speakers ever get low enough, which we try to make sure that never happens, I'm going to say, man, it's loud in here. Well, we do that on purpose so that you can't hear the person beside you and they can't hear you. Because if you hear yourself, you'll quit. You know, you go, whoa, wait a minute, you know, get intimidated and say, boy, I look terrible. I sound terrible. Well, not to the Lord. You know, you sound beautiful to the Lord. Now, it may be only him and you that like it, but I mean, it, it is, you know, thing. But, uh, man, I, I just you know, go that say. It's just, yeah, it's just amazing uh, that the Lord would give us great people, not only great in their abilities, but people who uh, exemplify this in their lives. I mean, they, they, you know, I, I don't ever get the impression that when, when who, whichever one of our guys are singing or Crystal or any of them or Amy or any who may be, who may be up here singing and playing, you just don't get the idea they're up here performing something that's not real, that they don't really, this is not really them saying this and, and, and being this way. And so anyway, I, I praise the Lord for that because I guarantee you uh, as a pastor uh, through the years, I've been, you know, I've, uh, many times, I, of course, I, the, the preaching generally always follows some type of music and 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 encouragement to praise or worship, it, whether it's hymns or an acquire special or whether it's a, a team like we have and do things like we do. I've always, I'm, I'm up behind that. And I can just tell you that the environment that's created by this really matters. I, if I don't have to dig my way out of a hole, so to speak, you know, it's like, it's like somehow this has been detrimental to the Spirit of God and I find myself trying to help you get over whatever, you know, it was. It just doesn't seem to be, you know, all together together. Uh, it's a joy and a privilege, and I can't think of one time in all of these, uh, goodness, how many is it, 11 years now, roughly? We started in an elementary school, you know, in a little classroom in an elementary school, and, and uh, I, uh, even the first service, you know, it was like, you know, it was like two or three, three or four of these guys. And uh, it was still awesome. And uh, they always usher us into the throne. And that is a tremendous word of, the, of God anointing them and uh, them being able to usher us and help us. And, and that's their desire. You know, I mean, the music is not just the, the warm-up act before the preaching. And, and it's part of, it is preaching. It's just in a different form to you, and it kind of prepares the spirit to, to be receptive to the things of God, and especially when you're in the, a book like the book of Revelation, because I'm going to tell you, we're just, we're just dabbling in the beginnings of the book. We're in chapter 4, for those of you that I know most of you have been here, and uh, you've been with us through these four, uh, where we are now, the first part of the, uh, uh, the fourth chapter where we have all of these wonderful things going on in heaven. In the first chapter, you know, in verse 19, Jesus himself tells us how to look at this book. He says, this is the book in, first one, in verse 1. These are the revelations of, tell me the next two words, 
Jesus Christ. So you say, what's the book about? Well, the book is about how Jesus Christ is revealed. In other words, what's Jesus doing in these last days? What's Jesus doing when these uh, around the throne? What's Jesus doing in relation to judgments that come on the earth and things that follow the earth? And what's Jesus doing when the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign is established on earth and then the recreation and, of heaven and earth and all of us being ushered into eternity you know, and glory and all of that? What's Jesus? So the book of Revelation is about who? It's about Jesus. The book of Revelation is not about the Antichrist or the false prophet or the beast or some beings that fly around a throne or some, you know, things that are happening on earth. Those are just the events. What the book is doing is showing you Jesus and the majesty of Jesus and the greatness of Jesus and the glory of Jesus and the power of Jesus. So when you study the book of Revelation, what you're doing is studying the book looking for Jesus. And if you miss Jesus in the book of Revelation, you miss the whole point of the book of Revelation. It's to tell you what Jesus is doing in the grand scheme of everything. Not only what he's done in your hearts through the gospels and the, and the letters and the acts of the apostle and all, but what is Jesus doing all the way up to the end, man? Jesus is the star of the show, so to speak. So what we want to do is let's look at what this says about Jesus in these last days. And then he says in verse 19 of that first chapter, I'm going to talk to you about the things that you have seen, which you have seen, Jesus the Great One. So chapter 1 is all about Jesus and his majesty. And, and uh, you know, he comes riding on the end on the horse, and, you know, he's got all of these tremendous things, and you've seen him this way. You're not surprised by this. So talk about the things you have seen, and then... Chapters 2 and 3 talk about the way things are. And to talk about the way things are, he says, I'm going to use seven churches to show you how things are, to tell you how it is when the church is on the earth. It's called the, it's called the day of grace. It's called the times of the Gentiles. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a Gentile. <laughs> I mean, I'm not trying to offend you. I'm not trying to hurt your feeling, but you are a Gentile. Anybody that's not a Jew is a Gentile. You are a Gentile. And so there is a time in the Bible where it calls it the times of the Gentiles. It just means that heaven has been opened up to the Gentiles, that the Spirit of God convicts the Gentiles. The Gentiles hear the word. They respond to the word by faith, and they're invited into the family of God, and they become the kingdom of God. So it's not only, you know, God made a covenant with the Jews in the Old Testament through Abraham, which he will ultimately keep, and you'll see this in the book of Revelation. It's just astounding what God does with his, with his covenant with the Jewish people. It's just amazing. I mean, even to think about the Jewish people is just amazing. Have you ever thought about this? You know that the Jewish people are not a gigantic population as far as the population of the earth is concerned? I mean, have you ever thought about this? I mean, think about this. Think about, all right, here we have a tiny little nation. From here to Wiggins Wide, at its widest point, from here to Jackson, Mississippi, north and south, at its furthest points, tiny little dot on the world, tiny little place, that all through the history of the world, when the Babylonians and the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans and the British Empire and all through the ages has been the focus of the world. There have been wars. There have been struggles. There have been uh, uh, treaties. There have been declarations. There have been, and it's all over this tiny little place. And even right now, 2018, just, a, just ba basically December of 2017, the President of the United States declared that Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, will be where the United States takes its embassy from Tel Aviv. What it was doing there, uh, only cowardice knows. But, but 
But Israel says, Jerusalem is our capital. Put your embassies in Jerusalem. That's our capital. And we said, no, we can't offend the Palestinians and blah, blah. So we'll put it in Tel Aviv, even though you say your capital is Jerusalem. And then in 2017, our, December, our president said, all right, we're going to move our embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem and say, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. Jerusalem's always been the spot on the earth that all of the strife has been about. You say, what is this deal with the Palestinians and the, and the Israelis and the Arabs and the Israelis and the Egyptians and the Israelis and the, and the Russians and the Israelis and the Europeans and the Israelis? What has what this struggle always been about? It's been about this tiny little dot on the map that God calls the apple of his eye. The scripture says that, he, that, he, that Jerusalem is the apple of God's eye. And it's all over this tiny little dot where Jesus is going to set up a throne one day and rule for a thousand years on this earth. <laughs> Woo! But think about it. The Israeli population is two-tenths, now get this, two-tenths of one percent. The earth has right now upwards of a little over seven billion people on the earth. The population of the United States is about 320 or 30 million people. We're about 6% of the population of the world. Tiny little Israel is two-tenths of 1%. And yet look what they've attributed. Look what they've, look what they've added to this earth. Look at, the, look, look at the inventions, look at the blessings, look at the, the creations, look at the, at, at the additions to the uh, economy of the world and the creation of the world and the blessings of the world and the knowledge of the world and the, and the, and the participation in the world that two-tenths of one percent of the population has added to this world. And think to yourself, how in the world could so few add so much. It's out of proportion to the tiny size of their population that they could be so significant in this world that we live in. How does that happen? God blesses it. And all of this struggle is about what happens to Israel. What happens to this tiny little dot on the map? I mean, we have cities in America that are bigger than the population of Israel, the whole population of Israel. And yet all this struggle is about it because it is the apple of God's eye and it is the target of the enemy of God. I'm sure that, that, that Satan in his delusion, and make no mistake about it, Satan is delusional because he somehow thinks he can fight with God. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Satan is really, I mean, we really almost couldn't qualify him as an enemy of God because he's so insignificant and weak. Satan is not comparable to God. God is, God, God is creator. Satan is a created being. Look at your neighbor and say, he's like you. Now, he's not human, but he is created by God, which means he didn't exist at one time, and he was created just like you were by God. He was one of the, one of the anointed cherubs. The Bible says he was the anointed cherub that covered the throne of God. What does that mean? It means he was a cherubim angel. Most likely, I mean, we don't know a tremendous amount about the angels. We know a little bit about them because they're talked about in the Bible, and the cherubim angels are mentioned in the Bible, and the seraphim angels are mentioned in the Bible by name. It appears that the cherubim angels are the highest order of angels because it was the cherubim angels that God put around the tree of life when Adam and Eve ate of it in the garden so they couldn't come back and eat of it and live forever without, without redemption. It was a cherubim. God said, guard the tree, and he gave them flaming swords and, and tremendous power. And man, they were just awesome. They were, they were, they were beings that, that, that no one could violate, strong. And, and the Bible says that Lucifer was the anointed cherubim, the anointed one, the high, maybe the highest cherub that was there 
until pride was found in him. And he said, Isaiah said, he, he said, you know, I'm going to exalt myself above the throne of God. I'm going to, I'm going to be worshiped like God is going to be worshiped. I'm going to show God that I'm just as great as he is. And God went, poop, kicked him out of heaven, fell to the earth. And boom, he became, he became the fallen one. Diablos, the devil, Satan. And he's created. So that means he doesn't, have, he doesn't have any of the powers God has. He's not really a, a, an adversary of God because he's not even strong enough to be an adversary. He do, he's not omniscient. God is omniscient. What does that mean? He knows everything. You don't have to say anything to God for God to know everything about you. Where you are, what you think, why you did it, when you did it, how you did it, what you meant when you did it. Don't think you're going to stand before God and con him. Don't think you're going to stand before God one day and tell him something he doesn't know about you. You are naked before God. Well, he knows everything about you because he's omniscient. Now, the devil doesn't know everything about you. The devil only knows what you tell him. Now, he has a vast array, a network of, of demons, of fallen angels that fell with him. The Bible talks about those angels that left their first estate. They were created angels, but they thought, hey, Lucifer, our boy's got a chance, so let's go with him. And, of course, they got booted out too. And they became the network that we call demons. And these demons work along with Lucifer to try to uh, intimidate, antagonize, and disrupt the creation of God and keep the events of God from happening like God plans for them to happen so that hopefully in disrupting the, 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 the plan of God that they can keep Jesus from coming back and sitting on the throne and their ultimate destruction. They know what's going to happen in the end. They know that if Jesus ever comes back and sits on that throne in Jerusalem, that that spells their end. So what are they doing all through our life, all through this times of the Gentiles and even the Old Testament? Well, they're trying to do everything they can to disrupt the plan of God, so hopefully dis disrupt their, their ultimate doom in the end. So when you speak things, when you say things, when you do things, there are demons, if you want to picture it this way, with a little, little notepad going, oh, yeah, let's write that down. Okay, that's their tendency. Okay, when we present them this, they have the tendency to choose this. And so if we want to really mess them up, let's just give them more opportunities to do this. So they'll make wrong choices and they'll walk away from God rather than toward God. And through this vast array of intelligence sources that hear you think, say things like, well, if I see her today, it's going to ruin my day. All right, thank you, sir. You just told me how to ruin your day. Let me make sure that she crosses your path. Let's make sure this aggravating, annoying, devastating thing happens to you so that, you know, you can be discouraged and you can be defeated and you can be intimidated and think God doesn't love you and God's not watching for you. And it's all an attempt to lead you away from God. But it's there because you exposed yourself. Pray for strength. James says, when I'm in a trial, because they're certainly going to come, I need to ask God for wisdom. Wisdom about what? Wisdom about what this trial's all about. So that God can lead you away from that devastating thought of Lucifer planted in your mind and lead you toward him. So Satan doesn't know everything. God does. God is all-powerful. He's a big theological word, omnipotent. Omni meaning all and impotent meaning power. He is all-powerful. God can do anything. God can change the seasons. God can, can, can rearrange the universe. God can call mountains down and tremble in volcanoes. God can do anything. Satan can't do anything because he's not all-powerful. As a matter of fact, he has no power at all. Satan can't do anything to you he wants to do. If he could, you would already be dead. If he could, he would destroy and devastate you. 
The book of Job is all about a battle between God and the devil. If you want to read about it, if you think, man, I believe you're stretching it, Pastor. Well, just you don't even have to read the whole book. Just read the first chapter of the book of Job. In the book of Job... There's this, there's this, Job is praising God and all of that. And, and God uh, looks at Satan and, and, and says, hey, have you, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says, yeah, I, I, I really would love to be able to get to him, God. I'd really love to be able to make him stop praising you. I'd love to really make him where he curses you to your face. But I can't because you have a hedge built around him. Look at your neighbor and say, thank God for the hedge. You know what the hedge is, Right? The blood of Christ. The blood of Christ stops the destroyer from coming in and ruining your life. And, say, and, and Satan says to God, I really would love to devastate him, but I can't because you have a hedge built around his life. Just like God has a hedge built around all of our lives or else they would be destroyed by the one who hates us and is working constantly to cause us to fall and fail so he can laugh in the face of God. He's a terrorist is what he is. He can't do anything to us. He can make us do something to ourselves <laughs> because that's what terrorism is all about is to encourage us to act um, contrary to the way we're created to act, to act out of fear, to act out of anxiety, and thereby really curse ourselves by removing ourselves from the care of God, from the fellowship with God. So Satan is not all-powerful, so he's not really an enemy. He's just a, a nuisance. And then there's one other thing. God is present everywhere called omnipresent. God can be everywhere at one time. God can be in your heart and in my heart, and God can be standing on a mountain, or God can be transfiguring into heaven and just fill all of us at one time. Why? Because he's everywhere. Through his Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of us, God is in every one of our lives. You say, where is the sanctuary of God? Well, it's certainly not, you know, in some little strip mall in some little building down here in Gulfport, Mississippi. God lives inside of you. You are the sanctuary of God. You are the temple of God. God lives inside of you through the Holy Spirit. The devil can't be but one place at one time. What is true about you? You can only be one place at one time. Am I right about it? Has anybody discovered how to be two places at one time? If you have, tell me the secret. I'll patent it, and we'll all get rich off of it. Because as far as I know, everybody in the world said, man, I wish I could be two places at one time. But you can't be. Neither can the devil. The Bible says, you know where he is right now? The Bible said right now he's standing in the presence of God, you will read this in Revelation. You'll see it. I'm not making this up. It says, you know where he is right now? He's in the presence of God because God allows him to be. And he's accusing you day and night before the throne of God. I hear you saying it, you know, and I know what you mean. But I just want you to be, you know, theologically right when you say this and to know that you've never encountered the devil. I know you think you have. I know, you know, you say, oh, like, like Flip Wilson used to have that saying back in the 70s, the devil made me do it. Well, no, regardless of Flip Wilson's theology, the devil didn't make you do it because you've never encountered the devil. How could the devil be in the presence of God accusing you and on earth messing with you? He can't because... He's created like you. He can't be in two places at one time. Now, I'm not saying you haven't encountered demonic forces. You've not encountered uh, demons that are sent to, to hassle you and distract you and do all of that. I'm not saying you haven't encountered evil, but you've never encountered the devil himself because he can't be there and here at the same time. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, see, he's not really a formidable enemy of God. He is not the anti-God. In order to be the anti-God, you have to be equal with God. And he is in no way equal with God. He's a nuisance. He's a vermin, a varmint, you know, a parasite. 
in the, in the big scheme of eternity. And he'll get his comeuppance in the book of Revelation. You'll see. He'll come to his end in the book of Revelation, and he knows this. It's going to be an unceremonial, uh, totally uh, pride-killing, uh, you know, just, just devastating, uh, unceremonious fall. It's going to be horrible, and it's going to be very embarrassing to him, very, very demeaning to him. You'll see in the book, it's, just, it's amazing what happens to him. Well, he knows this. And so he's doing everything he can to disturb this order as if to stop what ultimately is going to happen by any means that he can. So the book of Revelation says right now we're in a time where the Spirit of God is on this earth. It's called the times of the Gentiles. But this time is coming to an end. There's going to be an end of the days of the Gentile. The times of the Gentiles are going to be fulfilled. In other words, there's a certain amount of time that God has set in eternity for the times of the Gentiles to be established. And according to chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation, uh, there are seven church ages. It's the way we interpret it. And the only way I, I know how to look at it, really, in the big scheme of things that there are seven church ages and the church acts a certain way in each of these ages and we're in the seventh one. Everybody say, there are no more. So that means there are no more ages. We're in the last one. And I know you can look around you in this world and see how feckless the church is. How, how non-threatening, um, a non-inclusive, what, what a feeble, what a feeble entity the church is in this world we live in. The church has no respect. Everything that is exposed about the church is terrible. Whether you're talking about Catholic priests that molest thousands and thousands and thousands of boys and or baby girls, little kids, covered up by the hierarchy of the church, Wickedness and evil in high places? Are these marauding uh, charlatans that pretend to be gospel ministers that preach about homosexuality and incest and abuse and alcohol and drugs and whatever like they're some champion of morality and all the time they're meeting some little male prostitute in another city and they have thousands and thousands and thousands of people listening to them every week going, you're the greatest, it's the walls. And then all of a sudden, boom, they get arrested for being some pervert somewhere. And the world goes, I knew they were all fake. Yeah, church means nothing nowadays. Matter of fact, you're probably looked down on if you go to church. The people around you go, why do you believe that garbage? And it's probably negative to you or detrimental to the people you hang around or the people that we work with, the fact that you go and believe this malarkey that they think we're preaching. Yeah, this is the last church age. This is what the Laodicean church age at the end of chapter 3 tells us that the church is going to be like. It says this is how it's going to be. And sure enough, it is just like that. So we're about to get ready to ride. Yeah. And in chapter 4, the last designation, the things which you have seen, the things which are, and then he says, and the things which shall be hereafter. So in chapter 4, we enter the things which shall be hereafter. After what? After the church is called off the earth. After the true Spirit of God leaves this place, and I believe this for several reasons, and I've given them to you in messages that have come before, and I'll say even more about it today and in times to come, just little things that make me feel that that's right, that that's, I've, I, I, I've seen that in the right way. But in chapter 4, we're called into heaven to this gigantic worship service. Just to show you uh, what is the focus of this big worship service, this you, if you read chapter 4 of the book of Revelation, well, as a matter of fact, let's just do that. And I want you to know, I want you to notice there are only 11 verses, so don't get all panicky, all right? 
I mean, this is a very short chapter. It's only 11 verses. But in that 11 verses, look at what the central focus of all of those 11 verses are about, and you'll find the word throne mentioned 14 times in 11 verses. So what is chapter 4 about? It's about the throne. We're called around the throne of God in the middle of a gigantic worship service. Let's just see it. After these things, this is John speaking. After these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me. Who, who is this trumpet voiced person that's speaking? Well, you know, because you've been here, it's Jesus himself. Jesus is described in earlier chapters. John said this this one that had a voice like a trumpet, in other words, it was so commanding, so piercing, so dominating, so, so loud, so you know, uh, pervasive that it just pierced everything. It was like the sound of a trumpet. It was like that shofar blowing before the church service. The band could be playing as loud as it wanted to play. It could be, you couldn't hear a thing in here, and I can get up here and blow this horn, and it'll pierce right through all of that. You'll still hear the horn. Why? Because it pierces through the sound. And John says, somebody that had a voice like that, that just pierced through everything, spoke to me, and it's identified as Jesus. So here's Jesus speaking with me, saying, come up here, and I'll show you the things which must take place after this. In other words, John, you... You 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 redeemed of man. You 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 uh, you you come. You that have come out and have been washed by the blood. You that are the church, the representative of the church. Come on up here where I am. So, the sight is the picture of the church, the true church of Jesus being lifted up to heaven. And now we're going to view things not from earth to heaven, but from heaven to earth. And you'll see us all over heaven in these next few chapters, all well, all the way to the end, but. Starting in chapter 4, you never see the church again on the earth. Uh, it's always in heaven. And so here we are, and he says, I'm going to show you what's going to happen after you leave the earth. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one that sat on the throne. And he who, was, who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne in the appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones, <laughs> you get that word thrones and thrones and thrones and thrones. I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their head. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices and seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God, not seven holy spirits. You know this. Isaiah says that the Holy Spirit has seven attributes. So when it says the seven spirits of God, it's just identifying the complete work of the Holy Spirit. Seven means complete or perfect. It's the number for completion, the number of perfection. But even though, you know, you say, well, we'll apply the number to it. Well, you don't really even have to because Isaiah says, here's how the Holy Spirit presents himself. And he says, and then he starts listing the attributes, and there's seven of them there. So this is obviously the complete work of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is there, and he's like lamps burning around the throne, signifying the fact that the Father's on the throne, and here's the Holy Spirit. Of course, we still have yet to see the Lamb, which is Jesus, but, but notice how it's described. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass, you know, fixed, uh, non-flexible, which we talked about last week, which represents, you know, God. God is firm. God is not flexible. He's, his physical laws are firm, and we love it because we depend on them being firm. When I drop this, boom, it goes down and not up. Why? Because God's law is fixed. When I boil something, steam comes up and not ice. Why? Because God's law is fixed. When I put something in my freezer, it freezes and it doesn't come out steaming. Why? Because God's law is fixed. And we depend on it being fixed and his physical laws are fixed and his moral laws are fixed. When he says, be not deceived, God's not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap. He's just as fixed with that being true as it is when I drop this, it goes down instead of up. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes, front and back. Now, the old King James uses the word beast. That's kind of a fitting description of these weird people, right? Or weird beings. And no wonder he calls them beasts. They look funny, right? 
mean, good night. Look at the description of these crazy things that are flying around the throne. There are four of them, and they're full of eyes in front and in back. In other words, all over their body are eyes that look out, like under their wings, on their body, behind them. I mean, they're just covered with eyes. Signifying what, would you think? I mean, that's not difficult, right? Signifying that they see everything. That God sees everything, that he's informed about everything, that this is, these beings are, are uh, intelligent and they're thorough and they see everything and they know everything. And so here they are, but, th- but, but not only do they see everything, look at these descriptions. The first living creature was like a lion. Oh my goodness. And the second living creature was like a calf. Now, uh, Ezekiel saw this same, these same creatures. And I put it a little bit of note reference, but if you read Ezekiel chapter 1, and some of you that have been in the Bible a lot in your life and you've been through studies and so forth, you've probably heard the teaching that Ezekiel saw the wheel within the wheel. Oh, he saw this tremendous vision. This is where a lot of the people that believe in UFOs get some of their weirdo thoughts about, you know, what this means. They They think Ezekiel saw some... Uh, spaceship from aliens from somewhere. Well, it was Ezekiel describing what this cra- strange creature was, and he, he said that these beasts, these, these creatures flying around that he saw the glory of God, that they were, they were living beings that had four faces. In, in other words, every one of them had four faces. They were not just four beings that one had a face like this and a face like this. No, all four of them had all four faces, depending on what angle you saw them from. You saw whatever face was facing towards you, and he describes them pretty good, and they're the same four beings. And four living creatures, uh, and the second living creature was like a calf. He, uh, Ezekiel called it an ox. The third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Oh, my. That's not all. These guys are kind of unique. And the four living creatures, each having six wings, they were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and who is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. There's the whole chapter. A worship service going on in heaven, and we find ourselves jumping right into the middle of a worship service. Now, last week, there are two things that seem to occupy John's attention when he gets called into this worship service. So he spent last week, and if you don't have that, you know, if you can't remember everything about it and you want to remember things about it, just look back, you know, go to YouTube or Facebook, wherever it might be, and you can find last week's word, and you can hear what it's about. It was about the throne. The first thing that captivated him was the throne. And you remember he described the guy, the, the one that was on the throne. He said he's like a diamond, and he's like a flashing red ruby because God's a spirit, and he, we must worship him in spirit and truth. And he looks like this gigantic uh, cloud of a mixture of brilliance like a diamond and ruby flashing like the holiness of my God is a consuming fire and blah, blah. And then he described how the throne looked. It had an emerald rainbow around it, and it was just majestic and all. But he not only is captivated by the throne, he's captivated by the congregation of people around there. I mean, it was like, John says, let me tell you who was there. And he starts describing to us who was at this throne, who who was in this worship service. Now, I know you're looking at yourself, and you're probably thinking, well, am I there? Well, you certainly are. Now, you're not being described yet because he starts at the throne and describes those that are closest to the throne first. He said, let me tell you who the major actors are in this praise service in heaven. Isn't it amazing that the first picture we see of the church in heaven 
we're in a gigantic praise and worship service somewhere. Goodness. And there are some leaders of this, and, and he begins to describe them. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break them down into two. First of all, the cherubim acknowledge him as the holiest one in the universe. So the first group he begins to describe to us are the cherubim angels. This is, a, this is a group of angels. This is a description of angels, the cherubim angels. I've said this to you before, and I know it's redundant to say it again because you remember everything I say. But, but uh, anyway, <laughs> you know that a cherub angel is not a baby angel, right? You do know this. You know there are no such things as baby angels, right? That's kind of a Catholic theology mythology there. I don't, know where, I don't know where they got it from, but probably from one of those butchers that used to be a butcher and turned into a priest one day and said, you know, this seems to be what we need to hear about, some baby angel somewhere. There are no baby angels. And by the way, you'll never be an angel. I don't know if you know this. I know you hear people say, oh, I'm going to go to heaven, I'm going to get my wings, I'm going to be an angel, you know. Kind of like some of these crazy theologies that come out of these movies that we watch, you know. I'm going to get my wings. No, you're not. You're not an angel. Look at your neighbor and say, well, I knew that, okay. I've been telling you you're no angel. Okay, it's confirmed now. You're not one and you won't ever be one. Because you are created a human being and angels are created angels. God created angels. And they are always angels. They never are anything else but angels, and you are never anything else but a human. As a matter of fact, for you to think that you become an angel would be a demotion. You would actually be stepping backwards in the order of creation because as a human being, you are a son or daughter of God. And, 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 and we're created maybe a little lower, the Bible says, than angels for a while, and the only reason we're lower for a while is because we haven't received our glorified body. But one of these days, when we receive our glorified bodies, the angels are going to be really much smaller and much more insignificant than us. We are the adopted sons and daughters of God. Jesus is our brother and God is our father. And, and we go and we live forever with him, never to be an angel, only a human redeemed and given a glorified body living in the presence of God. And angels aren't babies because, can you imagine, that really it would be terrible to be a baby throughout eternity, wouldn't it? I mean, think about it. What is true about babies? Well, they don't even know what they are. They don't know who they are. They don't know, they don't know how to live life. They don't, I mean, they, don't have, they have no experience in life. They have no growth. They have no understanding. Can you imagine going through all eternity not knowing who you are, not knowing anything about life? Not have, that would be torture and not good. If you've had a child that has died, miscarried, you have a child that has died, uh, abortion, you have a child that has died as a youngster, you know, crib death or whatever it might be, or one that was killed in some terrible accident and they're seven, eight, nine years old, something like that. Let me tell you what you're going to see when you get to heaven. You're not going to see some little child running to you. You're going to see a full-grown man or woman of God reared around the throne of Jesus with Jesus as his brother and God as his father, and he'll run to you and recognize you, and you'll, <laughs> and you'll know too because Corinthians says, when I get there, I'm going to know as I am known, which means what does God know about you? Everything. When you get to heaven, what are you going to know? Everything. I've heard people say, when I, get to home, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God. No, you're not. You won't have to. You're already going to know. But when you get there, you're going to, you, they're going to meet you and greet you, and, and you're going to recognize who they are, and they're going to be a full-grown spirit of God, just like you're going to be, the throne of God, reared by the hand of God. That's a comforting thought. They didn't have to go through all the horror that's here. They lived in heaven with God as their father and Jesus as their brother. And they're just waiting for you to get there one day. What a reunion. What a, what a wonderful, comforting thought of God. God's omniscient, man. He's, he's, he's omnipotent. He's great. And around the throne, the cherubim acknowledge him as being the holiest person in the universe. Now, I want to just teach you a second about about what they say, but then I want, to, I want to tell you what that, I think that means for us right now. 
Let's look at what they said. Now, I've given you just a tiny little, you know, rendition. This is an author's thought. This is the way the, the creatures described having four faces. And like I said, I went back to, Isaac, uh, to Ezekiel chapter 1, and Ezekiel describes the same creatures. And he says they were not just four creatures flying around with four individual faces, which it seems like kind of John leaves us thinking about in the book of Revelation. But Isaiah said that each creature had four faces, and it just depends on the angle that you see him as to which face you see. And remember, they're flying around and they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And they're worshiping and there's a lot of activity. And it's described, Isaiah says that they had six wings and with six wings they did fly and, they didn't, and the wings didn't move and they just pew, 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 in whichever direction they needed to go in. You know what I imagine them? I mean, this is just my thinking about it. And obviously, I certainly am just guessing and thinking but I picture them kind of like uh, these, these, these cherubim angels. Isaiah described them as being seraphim angels. Now, the word seraphim just means burning ones. So these angels were burning. They looked like they were on fire. They were ablaze with, like, with the glory of God. And, they just, and, they're, they're, and remember now the trouble that heaven has in talking to us about what heaven is like is we don't have any understanding of what a place like heaven is like. There are things in heaven that we've never seen and we don't even know how to talk about them. And so as John talks about it and as Ezekiel talks about it and as Isaiah talks about it and Daniel talks about it, they're just doing their best to try to describe it in a way that we can picture in our minds what it is they're talking about. Like people who've never seen things try to describe things that others would have no relationship to and go, what are you even talking about? He said, well, it was like a, man, it was like they had six wings and it just went bleep, 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 in whatever direction it wanted to go without even tilting. Well, you know, it was unbelievable. These are UFOs, unique flying objects. <laughs> yeah, they are unique. And Isaiah said, uh, I mean, Ezekiel said they just, beep, beep, and I think of them like a, how many of you have ever seen a hummingbird? You, you, I mean, I, I, just my little crazy human mind pictures, you know, that like a gigantic hummingbird, you know, that those little wings, if you've ever seen them, you know, and if you've ever watched them and if you've seen them up close, you know, on some close camera or something, you see them in a little, and all of a sudden just, you know, it's just like, you know, just like that, you know, and just, and I mean, they just, they just give a little fleck to that little wing and, you know, and I'm picturing that's kind of what he's trying to describe. He's got, got six wings and uh, Ezekiel uh, said, uh, or, or Isaiah, I can't remember just at the precise moment, but one of them describes Isaiah 6 and Ezekiel 1, if you want to read about each of them. Uh, it describes them. It says, it says two covered their face and two covered their feet and two they did fly, you know, and, and, and they just went every direction. And depending on what direction you see them from, you see one of these faces. And one of these faces looked like a man. One of these faces looked like a, looked like a, a, a calf or an ox or something in that realm. And then one looked like a, a, an eagle, you know. And, 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 and so they, they flew around the throne of God and they just, you know, they, you would see the different aspects of them. You say, what in the world is that about? Well, it is kind of unique, isn't it? And, and, and what I want to say about it is that what it shows is it shows how thorough God is in presenting himself in every way imaginable to us. Now, I know this might sound a little, little bit unique. Maybe you've never heard this before, and it sounds like I'm trying to make up something for this to be about. But I want you to hear, and I want you to see if this fits for us, all right? Now, think about this. In the Bible, there are four Gospels. Are you aware of this? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Four Gospels. What do the Gospels do? The Gospels present Jesus on this earth. They give us a picture of Jesus on this earth. Now, how many of you have read the Gospels or you've heard sermons from different parts of the Gospels and you've said, man, this Gospel has lots more information about this section this gospel has some events that this gospel doesn't record. This other gospel has some of the things that are elaborated that this one only has one little verse about. And then this one doesn't really mention it at all, but it mentions other things that these others don't. Well, I'm going to just kind of give you just a tiny little theology thought right here and give you a word. So if you've ever heard it before, it can ring true to you. 
The first three gospels, Matthew, Mark, everybody say, that's Peter's gospel. And I want to, you know, I've explained that before. I mean, Mark is given the name John Mark, but, but really Peter was his mentor and most likely the gospel is Peter's re- recollection of the life of Jesus. But, but regardless, it doesn't matter. Uh, it, it's the Spirit of God that inspired all of it. It's, it's God's Word, totally. So you have Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These are called the synoptic gospels. Sin meaning alike or similar, and optic meaning to see. So the word synoptic means to see similarly, to see alike. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are said to see things in the same way. John, on the other hand, is not a synoptic gospel. It does not really see and present the life of Jesus the way Matthew, Mark, and Luke does. John takes seven gigantic miracles that Jesus performed, and John really revolves around these seven gigantic miracles to show you that Jesus is the Christ. He says this in chapter 20, by the way, I think verse 30. One or so, the next to the last, you know, John has 21 chapters. And at the end of the 20th chapter, he says, you know why I'm telling you things like this? So that you might see that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And that believing in him, you might have life through his name. So John says, I'm telling you the way I'm telling you so you can see Jesus the way he really is. And if you see him the way he is, you'll know that that's him and you'll believe in him and you'll have life everlasting. And John's also the one that says in the last verse of the last chapter, 21, he says, "Uh, I've just chosen these few things to tell you about Jesus because I suppose if everything Jesus did was written down, the whole libraries of the world couldn't contain everything that could be written about Jesus. So we have four gospels that try to tell us about Jesus and present us Jesus. Here we have a beast with with four faces. Now, get this, and hopefully this will mean something to you, but this really doesn't have anything with you going to heaven when you die, okay? So if you're going to go to the bathroom, go now, all right? I mean, this is just a little, you know, thought here for you. But to me, all of these kind of things just really scream out at the integrity of God to show us in every little tiny detail how these things all point the same direction. It's like the brilliance of God that even, the, even what these beings are reflect a connection with something that, that, is, that, is, that, that needs to be seen to see Jesus in the uniqueness that he is. It's just, it just adds more authority and more brilliance of God that you can admire and respect about the Word of God and about how God does things on this earth. It's just unbelievable. You have creatures flying around the throne and they have four faces. Why in the world would God create something like this? Well, I think it's because God wants to tie His Word with His throne. And He, and he says, all right, one of these had the face of a lion, it says. Well, The Gospel of Matthew talks about Jesus being the Lion of Judah. The Gospel of Matthew is written to the Jewish mind. If you've ever read Matthew, you see that Matthew talks about Jewish things, tabernacle things. It has lots of Jewish customs, Jewish words, Jewish ceremonies, Jewish things. It gives us all kind of things about the altar and about the, all of the activities and the covenant days and the, and the, and the, and the holy days and all of these kind of things. And it's just about all of that. And, and so what is Matthew written for? You say, you know what Matthew seems to be written for? It seems to speak to the Jews about Jewish things so that the Jews can see that Jesus is their king. To Matthew, Jesus was the king, and a king needs a lineage. And if you've ever noticed it in the Gospel of Matthew, they have the lineage of Jesus starting at Abraham and coming through the line of King David to prove to the Jews that a king has a lineage Jesus is king of the Jews. You need to see him as the lion of the tribe of Judah. So one of the beasts flying around the throne had the face of a lion. And then Mark, if you've read the Gospel of Mark, you see that the Gospel of Mark was written to show that Jesus was the one, and this is in chapter 10, if you want to read the verse, it says that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve 
and to redeem all of mankind, which shows that Jesus came as the suffering servant. So here's the face of a lamb, here's the face of an ox, the, the servant of mankind, a beast of burden, one that mankind uses and serves man all of his life. I submit to you that there's probably no other animal on the face of the earth uh, except maybe the gospel, the gospel bird, the chicken, that is used and served mankind as deeply as the cow does, the calf, the ox. They're a beast of burden, they're good to eat, and they're slow enough for us to catch, and, you know, and we enjoy every part of them. Just like Jesus came to serve us, to redeem us, to help us, to lift us. And so Mark was written to the Roman mind, the Romans, to show that Jesus is full of parables, is full of stories. It doesn't have a lot about the temple and the tabernacle and any of these Jewish things. It's written to show the Romans that Jesus was the one who came and suffered and gave his life for many. So the ox face is the gospel of Mark, and then the, uh, the man, the man face. The gospel of Luke shows that Jesus is the perfect man. The gospel of Luke is filled with parables all talking about how all of these things that God did was to help mankind Luke tells us about Mary and how Mary felt about Jesus. Luke tells us about what happened when Jesus was a child and grew up and, 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 and talked about human things. So Luke talks to the Greek mind about how Jesus is the perfect man. The perfect man needs a lineage, right? So Luke goes back to Adam, and he comes all the way from Adam tracing through the line of Mary, the earthly mother of Jesus, to show how Jesus was the king of the earth from the first Adam all the way through. It's quite interesting that, I know <clears throat> you may not be familiar with this phrase, but uh, the Bible calls Jesus, calls Jesus the second Adam. And I know that's kind of, you know, you know, here or there for us, but the first, it says, as in Adam all die, talking about the first Adam, why do we all die in Adam? Because we've been given polluted blood. Look at your neighbor and say, you got sorry blood. When Adam sinned, when Adam sinned against God, our blood became polluted. And from the time we sinned against God all the way till Christ come, as in Adam, the first Adam, all die. Yep, because we're unredeemed, we've given polluted blood. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. So, Jesus becomes the second Adam. The first Adam killed us. The second Adam redeems us. The first Adam sends us into a downward path. The second Adam redeems us from that path. Luke says, let me tell you about the perfect man. So I'm going to go back to Adam, and I'm going to trace his lineage all the way through Mary's lineage until he becomes king. So the face of the man on the four living creatures is the gospel of Luke, who shows us Jesus is the perfect man. And then John John sees Jesus as the heaven-born Son of God. He's the one that ascends up to heaven and comes back down from heaven. He's the one to which all of the earth is subject, and he's majestic, and he's flighty. And John speaks not necessarily to the Jews, not necessarily to the Greeks, not necessarily to the Romans. John says uh, things like, uh, and whosoever will, let him come. Uh, for God so loved the the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. And then he says things like, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if that wasn't the truth, I would have told you so. But he goes to prepare a place for you. And if he goes, he'll come back again and receive you to himself. Anyway, the Gospel of John is the face of the eagle. Whoo, the majestic flighty one flies to heaven, flies back down. I, I'm just saying, you know, why would God create a creature like this? Well, it's because he likes to take advantage of every opportunity to, to reemphasize what he's already told us about the things. But, but, but don't get caught up in necessarily what they look like, even though that's compelling, you know, that's unique. Look at what they were doing. The four living creatures, each having six wings and full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night. They're saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Well, not, 
look at what they were doing. What are they doing? They are praising the Lord, right? What are they doing? They're involved in a praise and worship service. They're praising the Lord. In other words, their primary thought, their primary thing is to worship and praise the Lord. I don't know why a lot of times we don't want to praise the Lord. You know, we have praise and our praise team tries to lead us in praise up here. And I know some of you are real shy about praising the Lord. Now, I don't know why. Maybe it's because you just weren't reared that way and, you know, it feels unnatural to you to maybe lift a hand or to be a little, you know, expressive about it. I don't guess you have to be really expressive about it. It's what's in your heart that really counts, you know. I mean, you don't have to dance around and do a jig and fall out and flip out on the floor and go through all of this stuff to show that you're genuine in your praise. However, I do like a little bit of something, you know. I mean, it's like, like, let me know. Let me know that you kind of got a thought about God. But I know that sometimes people say, just let me be quiet. I want to be reverent and worship the Lord, which is okay. That's fine. It has its place. And you'll see in heaven, there's moments of silence where it just, boo, boy, you're just overwhelmed by the presence of God. But it's really hard to imagine how much the Lord's done in our life and we're not willing to express it and praise him and worship him. I'm just saying to you that not only do these creatures reflect some you know, tremendous thing that we see, but what they do is important. They're worshiping the Lord, which says what? That the central focus of life is to praise him. What does praise the Lord mean? It means to brag on Jesus. Bragging on Jesus. When we talk about praise, we're talking about, okay, I'm singing something, I'm saying something that brags on Jesus. But anyway, it's time to go. I know that. Let me go on to the second thing. Uh, the elders acknowledge him as the highest ones in the universe. So, all right, John is focused on the throne. He says the throne is tremendous. Then he says, let me tell you who's around the throne. We have these beasts that are flying around, and they, they're, they're, they're angels, and they're singing holy, holy, holy. And then there's this other group of people there, and I'm going to make this quick, all right? But they're called the elders, now you say, what, are, what is true about the elders? Well, the 24 elders fall down. While, uh, verse 9, which I didn't put, but we've read up here, says, while, the angel, while these beasts were flying around singing, holy, 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 and they were praising the Lord, you have these elders who are sitting on the throne, and they're going to be doing something. And what are they going to be doing? The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne, and then they're going to say something. I'll tell you in just a second. <coughs> but... Just, just to give you a picture now and to call it to your attention, who are these elders? Well, these elders are obviously uh, human beings that have been redeemed. How do I know this? Well, because they're called the elders. The word elders is never used of angels. Angels are never called elders ever in the Bible. So there's not angels sitting on the throne. Elders are always representatives of the church. They're representatives of the leadership of the church. So out of the, out of the earth, now get this, get this, remember this, in order for them to have white robes and crowns, they have already had to be through the judgment seat of Christ. And I know some of you are going, what is the judgment seat of Christ? Well, there is a judgment seat of Christ that we all will enter into when we enter into heaven. And I hope I'm not saying anything that I have to really explain to you, but if you want to know about it, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and in there you'll see the judgment seat of Christ, that we'll all stand before Christ one day and we'll be judged, not according to whether our names are in the book of life, because if, we, if they weren't there, we wouldn't stand before Christ. We wouldn't be in this judgment. So it's not a judgment as to whether you're lost or saved. It's a judgment of what you did with what he gave you. It says, and every man's work will be tried there. Of, and then it uses this line, of what sort it is, not how much it is, not how big it is, but of what sort it is, which just simply means, what did you do with what I gave you to do? One of these days, you'll stand before Jesus, and the judgment seat of Christ is not a judgment as to whether you're lost or saved. If you're not saved, you won't be there. It's a judgment seat of how well you did with what he gave you to do with. So you won't be judged based on what I did, and I won't be judged based on what you did. You will be judged based on how well you did with what he gave you to do with. Some people have been given many more abilities. Some people have been given many more opportunities. And, but, but how well did you do with what he gave you to do? And you'll receive not a diadem, which means a kingly crown. You'll receive, and the, word, the Greek word is Stephanos, which means a victor's crown, like a laurel leaf, like you see the Olympic, like an Olympic crown 
crown. That's the, the leaves, the golden leaves, which means you're the winner. You're a victor. You've won, run the race well. And, 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 and these elders have these crowns on their head and they're sitting on the throne, which means God's called them out of all humanity. And there are 24 of them. And I don't know whether it's 12 from the Old Testament and 12 from the New Testament. A lot of people say that. You know, a lot of people say, well, they're the 12 sons of, Je uh, uh, of Israel, 12 tribes of Israel. But Dan and Ephraim did some terrible things. I don't know if they would have anybody on the front. But, but anyway, regardless, uh, I don't know who they are. I don't, know, I, don't, I don't know whether it's 12 and 12 or whether it's all 24 from the New, from the New Testament. But somebody, like Hebrews 11, you know, it tells us these heroes of the faith and all. It could be, could be a bunch of them. I, 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 I don't know, but it really doesn't matter. What matters is that they have been chosen by God to represent humanity on 24 thrones and they're going to cast their crowns at Jesus' feet and look at what they say. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. In other words, the, the, the beast praise him and the elders worship him. The beast say, I'm going to brag on you. And the elders say, uh, I'm going to tell you why I'm bragging on you. I put in your notes, worship means worthship, which means when I worship him, I'm telling him why he's worthy of my praise. So to praise him means to brag on him, and then worship means to tell him why you're bragging on him. What is he? What is he that's so worthy to be bragged on? He says, to receive glory and honor and power for you. Now, now, now notice this. This is what's singled out. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. What, what, what are the elders worshiping him for? Because he created everything. And, and, by, and for him, everything still exists. Now you say, what is that? Well, let me pop the evolutionist for just a second. This verse says that when we get to heaven, there are going to be some elders that are, going to be, get, that are going to be bowing before the throne and taking their crowns, which is a symbol of submission and worth, and throwing them at the feet of him that sits on the throne and saying, I'm doing this because you created all things and by you everything exists that exists and for your pleasure do they serve you. In other words, the angel says, we didn't get here by evolution. God created us. You're worthy, you're worthy to be praised and worshiped because you created everything. See, there are no evolutionists in the beginning and there are none at the end. A bunch of crazy ones during the church age trying to convince us that there's no God. It's ridiculous. You have to have more faith to believe that and you have to do believe evolution is crazy. But he said, this is, this is, God, you're worthy because you created us and because you keep us going. You know, I think about a song. Uh, I don't know, some of you have to be you have to be a little bit older to even remember this at all. How many of you remember somebody by the name of Andre Crouch? You remember him? You remember he's with the Lord now, and he sang a song called Through It All, and I, I remember it said, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, I'm learning to depend on his word, and he, and, he, and he starts with a line, and he said, uh, all that I am, forgive me for being on t off to you, and ever hope to be, I owe it all to thee. All that I am and all that I ever hope to be, I owe it all to thee. And then he says, to God, to God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory for the things he has done. With his blood he has saved me. With his power he has raised me. To God be the glory for the things he has done. That's our life. That's the worthy. You stand to your feet, would you? Stand. 